the moment I realized I was a bitch. I started my first professional job and they gave me a personality assessment. And I'm sure some of you can relate to this story. I read this thinking, that's a bitch and that's not me. <laughs> Everything that I saw about myself was not reflected on the paper. I mean, this person was aggressive. They feared boredom. They were belligerent when under pressure. And I just thought I was a strong, bold, hardworking young woman. But I couldn't have been more wrong. And the amazing part about that was that it did take me years to finally put all those pieces into place. I had to realize that my perception of myself had little to nothing to do with how I actually appeared to other people. In fact, that was all ego. Making that shift to be able to realize that when I was doing certain actions, I was making a terrible impression on people and potentially even alienating them was horrifying. But there's a switch to that. There's a time when you realize that if you can change the way you're perceived and own who you are as a person and your actions, it's actually a more powerful skill, the self-awareness the ability to change how you behave in your environment. It changed my life and it changed my work. One thing in the office that I thought was so inefficient was socializing. <laughs> I mean, I attributed it to the fact that I had kind of risen into a leadership role at a young age. I didn't have much of a peer group. So I immediately thought that the people who chit-chatted or went out after work were clearly wasting time, non-productive, and inefficient. <laughs> and I also was a little insecure about being a young leader and thought those boundaries would be better for me to advance my professional brand and my professional career with leadership. I couldn't have been more wrong. We as people are not just about work. I had my personal relationships at home, and I didn't realize the value of walking around the office and even saying hello, understanding about people's weekends, their, their children, knowing actual personal interests or what they might enjoy doing. These small pieces created human fabric, human interest, something that people really could grab onto and it changed my relationships with teams, and it made it easier for me. So I'm starting to figure out who I am and my bitch. I'm not really quite sure yet, but I'm sitting on New Year's Eve. I'm 27 years old with my girlfriends, and we're all talking about our hopes and our dreams and everything, and they said, Aaron, what do you, what do you want for this year? And I said, um, I took a sip of my champagne. Um, I'm going to meet a man and get married <laughs> this year. <laughs> and they, they kind of sat there looking at me thinking, really? <laughs> well, yes. I don't know when it started. At some point in my life, I thought, well, when you hit 27, if you haven't met someone, girlfriend, you better get on the train because you're going to need to get married, you're going to need to buy a house, you need to have kids, this, this, and this, and that. Well, that year, I did what I do best. I closed that deal. <laughs> okay. Yes. Three months, met Mr. Wright. Six months later, I was engaged. A year after that, I was married, bought a house, two beautiful children. I was controlling my destiny. And let me tell you, it was delicious. That control was addicting. I couldn't get enough of it. I wanted more. It was a drug. So imagine I'm wearing this backpack, and I'm walking through my life, and i am got the marriage in here. I'm putting in the house, starting to redecorate the living room, hosting fabulous parties. Backpack's getting a little bit heavier. Um, all of the holiday events, Thanksgiving, Christmas, all right here. Super Bowl parties. Um, amazing children's birthdays, perfect outfits, Instagram-worthy family vacations, <laughs> and then the Christmas card of all Christmas cards 
to 250 of my closest friends to demonstrate how happy I was. And that backpack was so heavy I could hardly walk. Because I was controlling my entire environment and creating and turning this picture for the entire world. So what happens? I broke. I looked at my entire life, I looked at this backpack on the ground that was full of stuff and I was completely empty. I was controlling everyone's destiny. I was trying to make sure that everyone was happy and I was completely alone and empty. And when I broke, man, a type A personality, when it breaks, it shatters. <laughs> we do not like failure. And when I got back up, I had a very difficult time realizing that, that I had a large part of that responsibility. I got divorced. Everything that I had thought and built that was supposed to be those keys to making me happy and the trajectory of my life had completely fallen down. But it is at those times in your life that you realize and dig very deeply inside yourself and know that there are ways that you can change how you behave. I choose to influence. I choose to influence the world around me instead of try to control it. <clears throat> In that transformative time, and as I started to get back on my feet and change my behavior, at work people saw me, I was lighter. My relationships, my family members commented on how much I looked almost like, they'd ask me if I lost weight. I'm thinking, well, thank you, but no. Um, and all of those pieces put together gave me the opportunity to look at how I could actually change the world. So, I'm thinking about the next generation. And for that, I, I, I go back. In the 1940s, my grandmother was a flight attendant, stewardess at the time, on DC 10s. She had a little pamphlet and it said, become a hostess in the smallest kitchen in the sky. <laughs> you had to be between 5'2 and 5'6 and under 125 pounds, ladies. Perfect vision of youth and vitality. And when she had the job, it was a glamorous job. And when she met my grandfather, oh, no, you had to quit. You could not work for American Airlines as a stewardess once you got married. Imagine that. In the 1960s, my mother was part of an amazing civil rights movement. You know, I feel like that generation gave such legs to ladies, including allowing them to wear pants in the workplace, for starters, and really changed our ability to be able to be leaders. And we look at today, in the state of our world, and what we're dealing with, and the way that women are being treated in the workplace, and our ability to get into leadership positions. And I want to influence that change, not only in my ability in working as a leader, but I also want to encourage other women to look around themselves so that we can influence and give opportunities for women to be leaders, but make it a safe place too. That starts with our children. For my daughter, I hope she can own the airline. And for my son, I want him to know that it is okay to work for a woman, to be led by a woman, and to be raised by a strong woman. So I, I'm a working mom, clearly, um, and it's, I'm, I don't work just because I love what I do, which I do love what I do. I, I think about it when I wake up in the morning, but I work because I would mess my kids up. <laughs> <laughs> Micromanagement, et cetera. So <laughs> when I first became a young mother, I'm walking across you know, the, that school parking lot, you know, I'm dressed up not quite this nice, but in a suit with high heels going across the playground. And then you see them, the mommy mafia. <laughs> they got their uh, yoga outfits on, the big sunglasses. They're armed with a venti sugar-free vanilla latte. And they know everything that's happening at this school. 
And so as a working mom walking up, I mean, it's like, whoa. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen. So you walk across there, and then, then it starts. Oh, you look so nice. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Or I was staying up last night. I, I couldn't even wash my hair because I was working on my child's project till midnight. We're in preschool, okay? Um, and then the one thing that every working mom can't stand, I don't know how you let other people raise your children. Mm -hmm. Five times I've heard it. But the thing about it is that this is the classic woman's tale. We have the stay-at-home mom and the working mom. We are given an opportunity to be able to work together, and oftentimes, we are absolutely butting heads. It happens in the workplace, too. I'm sorry, ladies. It's got to stop. Men have been doing this for centuries, helping themselves up, and we need to learn how to do it. We're all afraid of rejection or not understanding who we are. We need to be able to take that time and understand who we are as women and rise up together. We need to encourage each other that that's not an okay question to ask or that, that may have bothered me a bit. Or also what I chose to do, which is kind of break down my fears and join one of the dreaded on-campus like association foundations and start working alongside them, <laughs> which... <laughs> I won't even go into that. <laughs> <laughs> ah. So this is our opportunity to be part of what can be changed for the next generation. We can be the change by understanding who we are and choosing how we are perceived. We can let go of some of this control. As good as it feels, controlling outcomes doesn't necessarily yield better results. And finally, we can embrace who we are. And where I am now, well, I'm a happy work in progress. I want, you know, am I a bitch? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I embrace my bitchiness by being aggressive but respectful, by being bold but having compassion, and by being real. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.